Saint Juliana was born in the late 1100s in Belgium. She was orphaned by the age of five and taken to an Augustinian convent where at the age of 14 she took the veil. By the age of 16 she began to have apparitions. And she had an apparition that she couldn't understand. It was an apparition, a very bright full moon with one dark spot on it. She, she told her religious superior about it and described it, but she didn't have the slightest notion what the significance of that apparition was. What was a bright full moon with a dark spot? Then one day, our Lord told her exactly what the apparition meant. Quote, That which disturbs thee is that a feast is wanting to my church militant, which I desire to establish. It is the feast of the most holy sacrament of the altar. At present, the celebration of this mystery is only observed on Holy Thursday. But on that day, my sufferings and death are the principal objects of consideration. Therefore, I desire another day to be set apart in which it shall be celebrated by the whole of Christendom. Close quote. Then our Lord gave her three reasons why he desired to observe this feast. First, to preserve faith in the face of coming attacks upon this mystery. Second, to strengthen the faithful in their path to virtue. Third, to make reparation to Christ our Lord for all the insults, blasphemies, and sacrileges that occur against the most blessed sacrament of the altar. Now, for years, St. Juliana didn't mention this apparition to any priests. Finally, she did mention it to some members of the clergy, including a Father James Pantaleon. Later, Father Pantaleon approved this apparition. What are you saying, Father, that priests can prove apparitions? No, they can't. But this priest, James Pantaleon, not only approved St. Juliana's apparition, but in 1264, even established a feast in honor of the most blessed sacrament of the altar to be held on the first Thursday after Trinity Sunday, because by that time, James Pantaleon was known as Urban IV, Pope Urban IV. And then to top it off, he asked two men, one a Franciscan friar and the other a Dominican friar, to compose the hymns in the office for the feast. Now, some of you might not know what the office is. The office, that's a divine office, or sometimes you hear priests call it the breviary. It's a book containing all the different prayers that we have to say. It's the psalms and the prayers that we say. Every week we go through the 150 psalms, plus a bunch of hymns, scripture readings, and whatnot. So that's in addition to the Mass, because all the priests and religious in the church, that's actually their official job, is to pray on behalf of all y'all, the living and the dead. And that that binds us under the pain of mortal sin. A priest does not have to say Mass every day unless he has a pastoral assignment, but he always has to say the office, and he's not excused except if it's impossible, like he's flat on his back with a respirator or something. So the office, Urban IV asked this Dominican friar and Franciscan friar to compose office. As it turned out, these two friars had been good friends since their university days. While they were working at this task, the Franciscan friar also known as the seraphic doctor of the church, St. Bonaventure, stopped in to visit the Dominican friar, also known as the angelic doctor of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas, and see how he was doing. While they were sitting there visiting, he picked up a sheet of paper which St. Thomas had written the Magnificat Anaphon, O Sacrum Convivium, which sometimes you hear the choir sing as a motet. St. Bonaventure was so moved by what he had read but what St. Thomas had wrote, that it just set his soul on fire. And when he returned to his own cell, he picked up his manuscript and chucked it in the fire. Although that's a great act of humility on the part of St. Bonaventure, it's a great loss to the rest of us mere mortals in the church. Anyway, after St. Thomas finished writing the, the office of Corpus Christi, he took the papers and set them on the altar in front of the tabernacle. And when he did that, there was a miracle. Our Lord spoke to him from the corpus, the little body on the cross, and said, Thou hast written well of me, O Thomas. That miraculous crucifix which spoke is still honored at Oviedo. Every time we sing Adorato Te, or O Sacrum Convivium, or Laudaceon, as they just sang right now, 
or O Sol Taurus Hostia or Tanta Marigold, those are all hymns or, or sections of hymns that were composed by St. Thomas Aquinas for this feast. So now we know about the origin of the feast of Corpus Christi, that our Lord had revealed to St. Juliana that he wanted a feast, that he arranged it so this cloistered nun gave this message to a priest who later became the Pope, that by order of that Pope, the greatest doctor of the church, composed the office for the feast, and that our Lord himself confirmed his pleasure at this by miracle. We also know that our Lord specifically required this feast for three reasons. First, to preserve faith in the face of attacks to come on the reality of the real presence. Second, to strengthen all the faithful on their path of virtue. And third, to make reparation to our Lord for all the injuries and blasphemies against the most holy sacrament of the altar. Okay. But there's one other really remarkable difference that sets the feast of Corpus Christi off from all the other great feasts of our Lord. The feast of Christmas celebrates the birth of our Lord some 2,000 years ago. The feast of Easter celebrates the resurrection of our Lord some 2,000 years ago. The feast of the Ascension celebrates the ascension of our Lord into heaven some 2,000 years ago. But unlike the feast of Christmas, unlike the feast of Easter, Unlike the Feast of the Ascension, all of which concern historical events from long ago, the Feast of Corpus Christi celebrates a current event, something that will happen today, right here, on this very altar. We're celebrating our Lord's real presence right here and right now. The real presence is a mystery of our Lord that happens today, right here and right now. So today, let's just take a moment to consider a few aspects of that mystery, the mystery of the real presence of our Lord in the Most Blessed Sacrament. Now, we're definitely just going to hit the high points. Again, this is a semester-long course that we're going to put into about seven minutes. So there's a lot more there than what we're going to hit. To do this quickly, we'll rely heavily on the second to the last official catechism of the Church, the Catechism of Pope St. Pius X, with some help from our own Baltimore Catechism. When did our Lord institute the Blessed Sacrament? At the Last Supper, the night before he died. Why did our Lord institute this sacrament under the appearances of bread and wine? The Blessed Sacrament is supposed to be food for our souls, so it's very fitting that Christ our Lord is given to us under the form of food and drink. What happened when our Lord said, this is my body, and this is my blood. When our Lord said, this is my body, the substance of the bread was changed into the substance of his body. When he said, this is my blood, the substance of his blood was, or the wine was changed into the substance of his blood. Wait a minute, Father. Are you saying, when you say the words, this is my body, when you say those words, the substance of the bread is turned into the substance of our Lord's body? And when you say the words, this is my blood, the substance of the wine is turned into the substance of the precious blood? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. But I thought Jesus was really present, whole and entire, body, blood, soul, and divinity, in the host and in the precious blood, whole and entire. If what you say is true, if when you say the words, this is my body, the substance of the bread is turned into the substance of our Lord's body, and when you say the words, this is my blood, the substance of the wine is turned into the substance of the precious blood, then how can Christ possibly pre pre be present, whole and entire, under the appearances of bread and wine? That's a good question. It is true, for example, when I consecrate the host, when I say this is my body, that the host from bread is turned into the substance, the substance of the bread is turned into the substance of our Lord's body. Those words have the power to affect exactly what they signify. But think about this. Our Lord has been resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven. That means his body can no longer be separated from his precious blood. And he can't die again. Remember that death means the soul is separated from the body. It's appointed man wants to die. He can't die again. That means his soul can't ever be separated from his body again or his blood. So wherever his body or his precious blood are, 
their soul is, and they're also by force of what's called concomitance, which is what Council Trent called it. If you have his body, you have to have his blood, you have to have his soul. And because who is he? He's God. His divinity will be there as well. It's impossible to separate them. Now, it is interesting that if they'd have had the most blessed sacrament on, on reservation from Holy Thursday through Easter Sunday, the blessed sacrament on Holy Thursday would have been our Lord's body, blood, soul, and divinity in the host and in the wine. Then on Good Friday, they would have been separated as the blood poured out of his body, and the host would have died, and the wine would have died. It wouldn't be wine. The precious blood would have died. It'd still be God, but the soul would have left. That's what death means. So it would have been the body without the blood or the soul, but it would still have been the divinity, because the divinity wasn't separated away. And the precious blood would have been the blood without the body or the soul. But then on Easter Sunday, it all came back together again. And then on, on Ascension Thursday, it all went up into heaven. All together. Our Lord can't be separated anymore. That happened once. So when we say he's really present, whole and entire, we mean it. When you say he's really present, whole and entire, do you mean like his eyes and hair and teeth and toes and so forth are all in the host? That's correct. He's all there, all of him, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Well, that's not obvious. That's correct. It's not obvious. No one, no one can believe this without the supernatural virtue of faith which is a gift from God. We can see John 6 was the gospel today. We can see if you read John 6 carefully, very many people quit following him. He turned to the apostle and said, are you too going to quit following me? Why would they quit following him? Because it takes faith. It takes a lot of faith to believe this. And we need to thank God that he's given us the holy faith. What is the miraculous change of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ called? Well, since the substance has changed, it's called transubstantiation. And it occurs because of the power our Lord gave to the words of consecration. After the consecration, is there anything left of the bread and wine? No, there is nothing whatsoever left of the bread and wine. But the species of the bread and wine are left. What are the species of the bread and wine? The species of the bread and wine, which philosophers also call the accidents, the species are the visible appearance, the quantity, and sensible qualities of the bread and wine, such as shape, color, taste, etc. Now, wait a minute. How can the species of the bread and wine remain without their substance? By the power of God Almighty. See, the reality of transubstantiation and the fact that except for the appearances, there's nothing left of the bread and wine whatsoever, and the fact that both species contain Jesus Christ and whole entire have all been infallibly defined by the Council of Trent, which means that we must believe this. It's a salvation issue. Okay, can you tell me why Christ is whole entire in both the host and the chalice? Because our Lord is just as alive and immortal in the Eucharist as he is in heaven. And as, we, as we've seen, he can't be separated. Where his body is, there also are his blood, his soul, and his divinity. By the almighty power of God, to whom nothing is impossible, and who is present everywhere, but still he's only one God, so also our Lord's body is really present in many places at the same time, but his body itself is not multiplied. He only has one body, which is present whole and entire in all the consecrated hosts in the world. When the host is broken, is the body of Jesus Christ broken also? No, only the species of the bread are broken. The body of Jesus Christ remains complete in each one of the broken parts. Does that mean that Jesus Christ is just as much in a particle of a host as in the whole host? Yes, it does. And you can see by the way the priest holds his fingers and thumbs together after the consecration, and by the way he carefully cleans the patent after communion, that even the tiniest particle of a host is treated with just as much reverence as an entire host. Why? Because it contains our Lord, whole and entire. Why is the Blessed Sacrament kept in our churches? Well, it's certainly not for his benefit. He's God. He doesn't need anything. He's there for our benefit. He's there because he loves us. He loves us. He's there so that he can be taken to the sick and the dying, if that's necessary. 
but he's also especially there so that we can come and adore him and visit him and talk with him. He loves us. As St. Alphonsus said, my Jesus, what a lovable contrivance this holy sacrament was, that you would hide under the appearance of bread to make yourself loved and to be available for a visit by anyone who desires you. I'd make a personal comment. I still can't believe it, as I mentioned to people this morning, that you can go talk to God whenever you want. It's something, you know, if I live to be a hundred in this life, I'll never be, not that I don't believe it, but it just astonishes me. You can't get a hold of any important person in this life, but you can always get a hold of God. It shows his incredible humility. Anyway, now that we've taken a really brief look, a really brief look at the mystery of the real presence, today on this feast of Corpus Christi, let's close with some Eucharistic reflections from the saints. St. Francis of Assisi said, For God to stoop so low is a marvel that is staggering. What sublime humility and humble sublimity that the Lord of the universe, the divine Son of God, should so humble himself as to hide under the appearance of bread for our salvation. St. John Bosco said, Do you want the Lord to give you many graces? Visit him often. Do you want him to give you few graces? Visit him rarely. Do you want the devil to attack you? Visit Jesus rarely in the Blessed Sacrament. Do you want the devil to flee from you? Visit Jesus often. Do you want to conquer the devil? Take refuge often at the feet of Jesus. Do you want to be conquered by the devil? Forget about visiting Jesus. My dear ones, the visit to the Blessed Sacrament is an extremely necessary way to conquer the devil. Therefore, go often to visit Jesus, and the devil will not come out victorious against you. St. Alphonsus said, You may be sure that of all the moments of your life, the time you spend before the Blessed Sacrament will be that which will give you more strength during life and more consolation at the hour of your death and during eternity. St. Teresa Avila, when she would hear someone say, If only I had lived at the time of Jesus. If only I had seen Jesus. If only I had talked with Jesus. She would respond, But do we not have in the Eucharist the living, true, and real Jesus present before us? Why look for more? Indeed, why look for more?